I was always the person that like, Hey, I made money on this deal. Like let's freaking put it all on red. Like let's just buy more marketing with it, which I think is to some extent, especially early on is like what you have to do if you want to grow in this business. Cause all right, we are here with Aaron Beal from San Antonio, Texas. If uh, you know him from Instagram, which you might, he's actually he's got a pretty, pretty famous. Following. He's pretty famous, self-proclaimed trailer boy, master shit talker of, <laughs> of other influencer folks out there. Um, and also a very, very good friend of ours that we connected with in our first, um, I guess, mastermind. It's funny, Aaron, I, I regularly use you as an example of like one of my, what I would call one of my closest friends, which is funny because we've only ever seen each other in person like three times, but we've connected <laughs> more than even a lot of my my college friends and stuff have such a, a great relationship that even distance can't stop it man yeah. that was so powerful it's, you know, it's, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> dan coming from the got heart. lots of quotes here. i know it's the it's the power of, of business masterminds right you establish kind of relationships but aaron man really really excited to have you on the show so we'd love to hear you know your your background where you came from and how exactly you became the self-proclaimed trailer boy. <laughs> for sure. But uh, for, so first I'll dive into, you know, my relationship with you, Mike. So Mike and I were in a uh, mastermind group run by Ryan Dossie. And we kind of initially connected over the fact that both of us were like, how long can we do this? We're kind of running out of money. And it was like, <laughs> the specific conversation was like, uh, I started doing pay-per-click ads and Mike's like, dude, I don't know if I can do another thousand dollars a month on something. And then we were both just kind of like connected on the fact that we were like, I don't know, we're going to figure this shit out or we're going to, you know, fall on our face and go get jobs or something. But that's kind of how we kind of connected and became friends, which is like fun to look at those posts like three or four years ago. Um, yeah. But yeah. So my background. So like you said, I'm in San Antonio. Um, we at this point probably buy six to eight houses a month. Um before that, uh, I moved, I'm originally from Ohio. I moved to Texas for a job in oil and gas as I was finishing a master's degree that I no longer use. Um, so worked in the corporate world for five, six years, eventually kind of just got fed up with that. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of old school. I worked in oil and gas. It's an old school industry where I was never like, I was good at my job, but I was never like old enough. Like I was never old enough to be like promoted or like be given responsibility or all these things. Um, and then like everyone else in the world that kind of like coincided with finding bigger pockets and me realizing like the ideas that I had in my head, people were like actually did and were kind of like figuring out. Um, so eventually quit my job and thought I had a plan, which I didn't have a lot of a plan. So I did the agent thing for a while, started working for, um, a broker who specializes in investments, uh, Long story short, did a few deals there and each one was like progressively more money. Um, and like after three or four, I was like, I think I can do this on my own um, and kind of broke off from there and use the connections and then, you know, join CCF and start learning how to market for my own deals. And then, you know, that was four years ago now. So ramping up over time and uh, that's kind of the quick, like how we got from there to today. So did you, I don't yeah. remember you telling me this, did you, um, own any investments or wholesale any deals before you quit your job? I had like two rental properties. So okay. I, so I had a rental property that, uh, I owned with some friends. We kind of just like jumped in and bought this rental cause I like wanted there to be less risk. So I talked two friends into like throwing in money for it. And then, um, I had. I think I had maybe two or three others. I'm, I had Airbnb my house and moved out of it. Um, like rented a room from a friend to save money and just have like low expenses. And then that was pretty much it. And then I think I had about another two houses kind of like right after that. So hmm. I had like three or four rentals, um, but very low expenses. And, you know, we're just kind of determined to figure the thing out one way or another. And, Quickly found out that the agent path isn't isn't for me at all. Um, it's not your that's not your skill set. No, man. I would I was like the investor from the agent, which just means that like everyone just like walks over you and you give them the exact deal they're looking for and they'll never buy it. So I would like. Can you write me yeah. an offer? Can you write me an offer every other day? Yeah, we get all these like bigger pockets people that are afraid to ever like pull the trigger, 
And I'm like, dude, I showed you like 60 houses and like 40 of them were the same exact floor plan. Like, do you want it or not? And then they'd be like, oh, we're just going to rent, you know? But, uh, so I kind of got out of that pretty quick. Yeah. So you started, you know, you started that realm. I'd love to go into your, I guess you started going into the off market world. Cause like I said, we started at very similar times. I think that we, we figured out that we started what, like maybe a few weeks. Yeah. You beat me by a month or something. With the CCF group. Yeah. Something like that. And then, so our trajectory to growth has been very similar as well as a result. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, we had like problems at the same time. Like you said, when we first met, we'd both been in that group for what, like nine months ish. Um, Has it really been that long since the, from starting till the first meetup? It was supposed to be in in April and then COVID happened and the world Mm -hmm. shut down. So they kept moving it. And then, so it went from April to August. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So we were both in that same struggle point and we both, you know, went to that first meetup and we're in the phase of, we need to figure it out or we're going to be screwed here because we're running out of money. Um, I know for us, the biggest change that we made was getting a sales rep Mm -hmm. because we had lead generation that was going fine. And both Dan and I just sucked at the sales part. We became, you know, a little (laughs) bit better with it over time, but that was our hiccup. But for you, you were always kind of the opposite. Right. I remember your biggest challenge over the years when we would connect is you were very good at the sales. It was kind of the systems. So I guess as you started to find success, what were the keys for you to, you know, sort of like figure out what that like what was going to lead to? That? Yeah. So. Yeah. So I think with me, there's been a lot of like ups and downs. Like I was always the person that like, hey, I made money on this deal. Like, let's freaking put it all on red. Like, let's just buy more marketing with it which I think is to some extent, especially early on is like what you have to do if you want to grow in this business. Cause people are always like, what's the minimum I can spend to get a deal when it's more like, Hey, you probably have better odds if you just spend more. Um, I mean, mm-hmm. that looks different at different levels, but, um, so I was like, Hey, I closed this deal for 30 grand. Like that's $30,000 a mail. Um, but my struggles have always been like trying to scale responsibly and like, what does that look yeah. like? So, you know, I went and hired an, an acquisitions manager and it's like, it was fine. It worked for a while. It wasn't really what I needed or like fit. You churned through so many AMs. Yeah, I've been through I a few. you on the phone. And I've been through a few. <laughs> You'd be, you went through like five or six in like a very short span, I feel like. What was like. the and shortest? Did you fire one after like a week or a day Dude, or something? Not short. You had a day. I've had a few I fired after like a week or two. <laughs> yeah. Well, the one like came to me like a weekend. He's like, hey, my... My car's going to get repoed. And uh, and he wasn't really, like, doing that great. Uh, like, as far as, like, work. And I'm like, <laughs> you probably just need to go get a regular job. Like, there's really good opportunity here. But, like, the time horizon is, like, 30, 60 days, 90 days on, like, stuff turning around. And, like, you just and told you me you haven't car. paid your rent in three months and you are going to lose your car and you're like hiding it and shit. Like <laughs> probably not the fit. And then I'm also really bad about like, cool. I like, like you, like you seem likable and you know, it's just not good. So I kind of took this step of like hiring acquisitions managers, trying to grow, trying to, um, you know, spend more money on marketing and then kind of went the complete opposite direction of like, I'll just do all that myself. Like I'm better at closing deals than the people I'm hiring. And then I don't have to pay them and I can put that money towards growing a marketing budget and then just kind of do what I feel like. Um, you know, if, if you, if you spend more money on marketing, you have better leads and then I can work the ones I feel like working and still honestly do better with less overhead. Uh, so I did that for, gosh, like a year or so. And then, uh, beginning of last year, um, partnered up with my now business partner, Jason, um, after I, you know, sold him a deal, we kind of became friends, realized we kind of had complementary skill sets and, you know, started exploring the like, Hey, what would this look like if we partnered up? Um, yeah, so that's, and then that's like to today. So we've been working together officially for like a year and a half of business together. And then, um, you know, he's really good at a lot of things I'm really bad at. And I think we balance each other out pretty well. Yeah. I think something that's so important that you went through with your journey there that I just want to point out is most people, when they get into this business, right, they start 
find some success, they decide they're going to try and scale. The first person they go and try to hire is an acquisitions manager because you go and watch every YouTube video. You talk to most coaches that don't know what the hell they're doing. You talk to, you know, read blogs, whatever. Everyone's like, that's an easily outsourceable skill. They always say this bullshit of like, go find a young, hungry realtor, quote Mm -hmm. unquote, to come and work for you, which is a really dumb thing to say. But you were in a position where it was detrimental to your growth and your business because you were good at that. Yep. So you went and you basically tried to replace yourself from the part that you were already good at and then put yourself into a position where you were going to be forced to work on the things that you didn't actually enjoy, which was the marketing, yep. the systems and the back end, all that sort of yep. stuff. Whereas like realistically, you know, where you're at now, where you met with Jason and, you know, he's your business partner. You guys have exploded like an insane amount over the past year and a half because you now have complementary skill sets. So, you know, like looking back in time, if you had had like, um, I don't want to say like better mentorship. I think you, I think we both had very good mentorship. But if, if there had been a different viewpoint of go and hire like an operator mm-hmm. to like do yeah. the back end and just let you run your own sales. And I think that anyone that's strong in the sales role should consider this. You could have probably started to escalate significantly earlier than you did, um, which I mean, it all worked out well in the end. But it's just interesting because I feel like so many people, they stall from growth because they're trying to do what everyone else is doing. But you were kind of one of the exceptions to like the traditional thought. Yeah. So I, I think you get to this point where, you know, you realize that like you can like have five successful coaches, mentors, programs, whatever. And they're all going to tell you like a different way to get there. And they're all like with a hundred percent conviction, this is the best way to do it. And you kind of have to figure out like who you align with, what you want your life to look like, what you want your business to look like and kind of figure that out where it's like, you know, this person saying, Hey, build this huge team, do this. Hey, this person saying you got to hire this person first. This person says hire this person first. And it's like, cool. Like, what are my skills? What am I good at? Where do I need help? What do I want my business to look like? What do I want my life to look like? Like part of like bringing a business partner so I can hopefully be detached if I want to, like I can go home more, I can travel more, I can do Mm -hmm. some of these things where there's someone who's like very responsible and it's not just like if I leave town, the business stops. Um, But I think the, the thing there is like figure out who you align with and, you know, figure out what you want your life to look like and do that. Like you guys, your guys' business today looks very different than mine and it's like great for you, but I wouldn't want it, you know, and probably vice versa, right? Like... And it's just, uh, I think so many people are like, no, this is the only way I do what I do. And it's like, no, figure out like what you want and then figure out like the people that do that and like who you align with. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think, I think kind of the, the challenge is, you know, that's entrepreneurship, right? And so many people, cause we're just indoctrinated by the school system, you know, where we went and grew up in history class in math class, you're taught that there is a way to do things, which in entrepreneurship isn't true, you know, and you go and you hire a bit like coaches, mentors, things like that to sort of help you build the foundation. But you're completely right. You do have to figure out what your ideal outcome of that is. So like even looking at, you know, like our businesses are very different. Look at the rest of the CCF crowd, which there are some insanely heavy hitters that are, have come out of Ryan's group. You know, a lot of people we've had on this show, if you go back over recent episodes, you know, we had Tara Fernandez, right? We've had Drew Waird, you know, very, very successful people with massive businesses. Mm-hmm. And all of our businesses look 100% different. Yeah. Or you even know, like at the, at the, like the world of like office or virtual, like work from home or work from an office. Like you could like argue all day about it. And it's like, you know, do you run pers- in person appointments? Right? Do you run them on the phone? Like, and everyone can give you a very good answer of why one's better than the other. And it's like, figure out what you want to do. Well, it's on top of figure out what you're, what you want to do. It's like, what are you good at? Yep. Some people are terrible at doing virtual sales. There's no way they could do it. Um, some people are, yeah. are fantastic at doing in-person sales <clears throat> where others can't do it. They just don't feel like they're not that good. And so I think building that business and some people aren't cut out to be in a virtual office. You know, that, that's a hard thing to run for a lot of people. For sure. For others, it's easy. Mm-hmm. And so I think, I think adapting to what you're good at and you did a lot of trial and error throughout your process of learning what you wanted and being okay with your business adapting and not getting stuck in what you think or what you thought you wanted your business to be when you started out because if that's where you're at you're probably never going to be able to grow or be happy because as you learn and grow as an entrepreneur your lifestyle your needs once you've opened up this world change Right. Once you see what's mm-hmm. going on in front of you. And I think a lot of people that aren't successful get stuck in 
what they think they wanted, which is actually not what they want. And then they can't grow because they're, they're afraid to, or they're uncomfortable, or it just doesn't work out for them. And we see that a lot. I don't know. That's probably like eight out of 10 people in this industry. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so while we're on that vein really quick, I guess when you decided to partner with Jason, aside from the complementary skill sets, I, well, I guess you guys have complementary skill sets. You guys had a mutual aligned goal and mission. What did setting up that partnership look like? That's a very common mm -hmm. question that Dan and I get asked, which we don't have a good answer for because we have a much longer relationship than just our business, but you guys kind of didn't. So how did you set up your partnership in the beginning to make sure it was going to be successful? Yeah. And that's a, man, that's a tough question. Um, cause I feel like 95% of the people that want to partner shouldn't, um, and like, like I jumped in and bought a rental with some friends just to like de-risk the situation and like none of it, like I wanted them to like have the vision I had and they never did. Right. And we sold it. We all made money. Life's good, whatever. Mm -hmm. But it was never like a good fit. Um, and I think people do that with business partners a lot. Like, oh, I'm jumping in. This is risky. Like, let's just bring someone else in. Um, but Jason and I, so I sold him, I sold him a deal and I don't, I, honestly, I don't wholesale much, um, but that one I did and it was I don't know, just a really like smooth, good transaction, which, I mean, you guys know the dance with wholesaling of like, oh, oh is this person going to know this? Like, is this person going to like, is the deal going to blow up because someone sends the wrong email? Like, there's just that whole situation um, and it was just super smooth. Uh, it went well. The project for him did not go as great, uh, but, uh, oh, no, I didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, I think he ended up breaking even on it. They, they kind of priced it too high and like it sat and then it was just like, whatever, but it's tainted. Yeah, exactly. And then, um, we just kind of like became friends. He like joined CCF and like, I started like, you know, helping him with some deals and stuff. And then I think we both were kind of like, Hey, what would this look like? So then we, we flipped a house together. Um, it's actually a, a rental for us now. Um, and then we just started exploring the, kind of that conversation and plan that out over like two or three months. Um, and there was a lot of things we could have done better. Like we, we could have been a lot more clear on, you know, responsibilities and, and stuff. But the biggest thing for me is like, he was good at the stuff I'm not good at, enjoyed doing the stuff I don't enjoy doing. Um, and we were very aligned from like a ethical, moral standpoint of like, how we want to do business like that to me is probably the biggest mm -hmm. of you know like i mean i'll do like short-term stuff with someone that i'm not like 100 on board with on things like cool i'll jb a deal or whatever but if i'm going to be in like a long-term like partnership relationship whatever um there's just a lot of things more important than like hey do we work together it's like cool how do we do business like what matters um how do we treat people like all of those things that we were very very similar on um, and then, you know, over the course of time, it's just been, you know, figuring out like, you know, how to stay out of each other's lanes, uh, which we've recently gotten better at, but it, that's, that's definitely a process. Cause you know, there's times when we're both doing the same thing all the time. And it's like, you know, like, I don't know, figuring out like how that interaction works and building that trust of like, like we had a conversation recently and he's like, you know, cause Jason's like the person that's like going to sit in the office, work for like 12 hours straight, like might take a bathroom break, but like is very content doing that. <laughs> and I'm the person that's doing like intangible things and like running around and like putting out fires and like talking to sellers, trying to keep deals yep. together and like just weird stuff. But I got to like be moving. I can't like sit still. Um, but so we've had conversations lately and he's like, I've realized like you don't do what I do, but you provide value and I don't always know what it is. And it's a little more into, like intangible than like what I do, but I know that like you, you provide value. And I'm like, oh, thanks. But it's like, oh, thank you. you know, I'd be like so sitting there and very, it's like, Hey, I just bought a deal off Instagram. He's like, how do you do that? I was like, don't worry about it. Just like <laughs> make your spreadsheets, <laughs> like pay our bills. Yeah. Like, cause I don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so when you guys first joined and I'm curious because you've said a couple things in here that are actually really important. One of them that you guys are working through the fact that you sometimes they're doing the same thing, which your guys' setup is interesting. We should dive into that. But um, when you guys first partnered, like what was that? 
what did that look like? Were you like, I'm doing sales and you do things I don't like, or like, how did that work? Cause you had been running the business and, and Jason probably, I think maybe a little bit less experienced on, on running the business. Um, maybe he was, I guess, newer. And so yeah. I'm just curious of how that worked out. Well, in my head, how it was set up was like, I'll do the sales and I'll like close deals and meet with sellers. And like, you, you'll manage our rehabs and you're really good at that. And now we kind of both manage rehabs, but, uh, that's you know, kind of what I was yeah. like to say, like, that's a weird setup. Yeah. I mean, so it, it was like, kind of like all the like back end, like accounting office stuff, whatever, um, you know, policies, procedures type, I don't know, all that stuff. And I kind of just met with sellers. Um, and, and just for context, yeah. Jason's a super smart, like, um, space force, um, what do you call that? Astronaut? Dude, I don't know. I don't know what he is. <laughs> Cosmonaut. He's, well, he's, 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 he's in the air force. He literally works for space. Yeah. Force, that's right. Yeah. I so, I mean, he, I guess thing. my point being is he's a smart guy. So you're throwing out all these things that you did not want to know that you're not smart, Aaron, but all the things that maybe aren't in your skill set in your wheelhouse that he picked up. Um, the thing that I'm curious about, know that you guys have been doing like a year, year and a half though, has that evolved into where maybe he doesn't want to do certain things or you don't want to do certain things. And now you're hiring that out or you're switching people that are doing that. Cause Mike and I sometimes switch who does what, um, or find out after a while we don't like doing certain things. Yeah. And that's changed a little bit. Um, honestly, I think the biggest thing is there, we were just both doing everything. Like it was like, we would both analyze every single deal. Like it's just, and I'm like, cool. Well, like you trust me to analyze this. Why are you analyzing all of them? Like, you trust my rehab numbers. Like, why do we both need to do this on everything? Mm -hmm. um, and then it was like, you know, projects, we'd both be like communicating with our contractors and we'd both be, we just kind of like double working a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's like changed over time. And, um, you know, since getting a business coach is really like, Hey, these are all the like things that have to be done as a company in our business. Like who's responsible for this, who's responsible for this. Um, so it's just been more, more clarity on a lot of that stuff. Um, I don't know that we've changed a ton. I mean, he still does all a lot of like administrative, you know, kind of back end type stuff, um, like transaction like coordination data, type stuff, marketing. data, marketing. And I'm more just like the, I guess, visionary for the company. And I'll be on like on marketing stuff. I'm like, hey, we should do this, this, and this. Like, cool, like make it happen. Um, that and just like anything like meeting sellers, sales, all that. So quick question here. Um, this is, um, Mike and I have an answer to this. Are, like, are you okay if Jason makes a decision and you guys lose money? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's where Mike and I, I don't, I think we figured out earlier on in our partnership where to like, Oh, let me run the comps on that. Let me run the comps on that. And inevitably we're both going to come back with different numbers. Yep. It's fine. Like, okay, mm -hmm. your job is to come up with the max offer. Your, my job is to come up with the, the rehab budget. And if we either of us screw that up, oh, well, yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a tough thing for a lot of people, though, and where partnerships fall apart. Um, I think it's because they have these two people that need to, like, be the decision maker in, in everything. And if their decision's not selected, it's like a battle. Uh, Mike and I have overcome that. And, like, that's not an issue for us. And I think what happens then when those types of people partner up, when one person does make a decision, that's inevitably going to happen. That may not be the, what the other person would have made and money's involved. All of a sudden, shit gets, shit gets weird. And then the partnership mm -hmm. falls apart. Yeah, there's definitely, and, and so, there's definitely some of that. Um, and I would say I'm probably a little better, but like, I'm like loyal to a fault, but also like mm -hmm. early on, like Jason would like ask me my opinion on things and I'm, I'd be like, dude, like I trust whatever you do. I don't like, like, I remember him telling someone like, if Aaron says he doesn't like care and doesn't need to be involved, like he really means that. Like, I don't care like what color <laughs> tile you pick. Like, I, I just don't like, if I tell you that I don't like have an opinion on it, like I trust that you're going to do it and do it right. Um, I mean, obviously the, the hard part with that's like you lose money on a deal, like, and it's, it's really hard to never get in the frame of like pointing fingers. Um, cause it's easy to like, look at something and be like, oh, well you did this and this happened. And it's like, it's just not like helpful. Um, when the reality is like, especially in the last year, we bought a handful of deals we've lost money on, which prior to that, like I maybe lost money on a deal and we still have a few turds we're selling right now just cause mm -hmm. stuff with the market. But 
it's stuff we look back at and we would have made the same decision again. So, but it's, it's hard with those to be like, well, you wanted this one or like you really pushed for this. And it's like, it's just not like healthy. So no, we're pretty good about not, you know, not pointing fingers and it's more just like, cool. It's in the past. Let's figure it out. Let's move forward. But it doesn't like help to be like, well, Jason bought, bought the bad deal or like Aaron bought the bad deal or, um, you know, you hired the idiot contractor or whatever that looks like. It's just, I don't know. It's something that we've, and there's always that temptation, like to think that I'm always right and don't make mistakes, but uh, it's just not healthy or yeah. helpful. When well, honestly too, if your business is in such a position that one person makes a mistake and it causes major problems, you need to reanalyze your business. Sure. You know, you, you do business for long enough, regardless of what it is, whether it's real estate or selling widgets or you're a, I don't know, a landscape, yep. right? Like things will go wrong that will cause you to have to do extra work that will cause you to get a bad review that will cause you to lose money. It's just part of the nature of business, right? Yes. But you just need to be, you need to find people that are mature enough with a long-term mindset to be able to get past that and aren't going to play the blame game. And then I would say if you, somebody does get in a relationship and you constantly have someone who fucks up all the time, then you should probably end it. Yeah. But if they're not you taking know, ownership for it, yeah, that's the problem. They're not taking yeah. ownership. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, cool. Awesome. So yeah, that, I appreciate all that insight. You know, it's, it's like I said, it's a very common question that we get and we never quite have good answers for people. Um, but I would love to dive into the little niche you guys have carved for yourself down in San Antonio, which is as self-proclaimed trailer boy, which is funny that started as like an old joke in, in CCF when you started buying up all these trailers that nobody else wanted, but you guys have done some really huge deals with mobile homes. And, and even to this day, I always laugh because we'll talk to newer investors, you know, in like the instant investor program and other things. And they'll be like, Oh, I don't want to look at that one. It's a mobile home. I'm like, I know a guy that does like, has done like six figure deals yeah. with mobile homes. Yeah. <laughs> Dude putting freestanding soaking tubs in the master bathroom <laughs> in a mobile home. Yeah. <laughs> That's not in the norm, yeah. but uh, you know, sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So I'd love to just like dive into sort of how, I guess, first off, how you sort of got into that. And for people that, you know, get these mobile home leads, these opportunities, what are some of the gotchas? What are some of the things that you look for that make good opportunities? You know, you guys have done a lot of them. So I'd love any, ex any insight. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, kind of how I got into it, uh, through a few things, a conversation with a friend who I was talking to about marketing and he pretty much just challenged me with the idea of like, there's something in your market that other people aren't seeing. Like, it might be condos, it might be land, it might be, you know, any number of things. But, you know, there's probably something outside the like absentee with equity that you can find and figure out that, you know, if you're able to figure out, there's probably money to be made. Um, so that kind of like coincided with our buddy Jacob Klein in Florida, who's in a really expensive price point and started buying mobile homes. And then I started looking at it and was like, would this work here? And then, uh, I just started mailing them because uh, I just thought that like, I kind of had this like hypothesis on it and I looked up, um, I started looking in areas where they sell because normally mobile homes are a little more outside the city. Uh, and just to clarify, we only buy them if they're on land. We don't do the like buying a home, sell it, own a finance, move it out of the home, any of that. Like I'm sure there's money to be made. It's not our thing. Um, but started figuring that out and I was like, because the big thing that will come up, which we can dive into more, is like, will someone be able to finance it? Like, will they be able to get a mortgage on it? Mm -hmm. um, but I started looking at some comps in some areas and was like, okay, like some of these have mortgages, some of them don't, but there's enough cash sales that I really don't care. Like, as long as there's cash comps and someone will buy these with cash, like, I don't, I don't care if they can get a mortgage. So that's kind of how I approached it. And then over time, I figured out, like, it's really not it's really not that difficult if someone's owner occupying it to get a mortgage on it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so I mean, it's like a thing if we get, we mail them, we've done other stuff, but like we get really good response rates. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, tricky things about them, which I can, you know, dive into some of the, the big, like two or three things to like look out for. Um, mm -hmm. You guys can interrupt me whenever I feel like I'm just uh, I love, I yeah. rambling yeah. about three things mobile homes. Um, what are the two, yeah. three things? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me, I, I want to make sure it's on land. Uh, it's not on land. I'm not messing with it. Uh, the other thing there comes down to the year it's built. So we kind of found out the hard way that if you uh, buy one before 1978, when 
FHA or HUD or whatever changed their guidelines for how manufacturing requirements for mobile homes. Yeah, it's about like how, how flammable mm-hmm. they are. They made it so that they couldn't use just a complete. Yeah, so you get one before solution. 1978, you better sell it cash or owner finance it. So, mm-hmm. uh, which we had a really nice one that we remodeled and financing kept falling through. And, you know, turns out no one wants to touch them. But it was like completely remodeled and nice in a really good area. But no, so. Let me ask you a question on this though. Have you had success doing like the owner financing route when you buy them? Like, so say you pick one up for pretty dang cheap and and you could do that. Would you? And is that a successful exit? Yeah, we have. uh, I mean, so we have one now we sold for, we bought it for a shoot. I'm trying to remember the numbers on it. Uh, Like 55, we put, I don't know, 30, 40, put like 30 in it. So we're in it for like 85 and we sold it for 170 and they put 90 grand down or something. They, so they covered on, on their down, we got all our money out. So yeah. now we have a $90,000 note uh, at like seven and a half percent that we own free and clear. Okay. Um, the hard part about owner finance stuff is the getting your money out of it or like the back end financing, um, which is a lot based on, you know, relationships with banks and, you know, proof of concept of a lot of that. But um, one of our buddies in town who does a lot of owner finance, like I've convinced him to start buying mobile homes that we sell them. Nice. Uh, and they're, they, they work for that. Um, but yeah, so yeah, with that, the, the year they're built obviously matters. Um, so I just, as a rule of thumb, if it's before 1980, it better be like free. Um, yeah. The hard part, you know, with, Financing is kind of a a two part thing. So getting a either hard money lender or private or whatever to loan on a mobile home is, is difficult for some reason. Um, and a lot of times the, you know, your standard hard money lender will do 75% minus repairs on their loan on mobile homes. They'll either not touch them because they're scared of them or don't think they have value. Um, or they'll do like 60, 65%. So, Honestly, it forces you to get better deals. And a lot of these, mm-hmm. um, you know, people just assume they don't have value. So I'll go in and, you know, we might offer like the land value and then like we'll get a mobile home and fix it up and, you know, make good money on it. Um, and there's all this like weird like stuff around, you know, has it been moved this many times? Is it on a permanent foundation? All this stuff for financing, um, which like, So our process is like, so generally with mobile homes, the land is titled through like your normal, like county, whatever the mobile home is through. It's almost like a car, right? It's like our, yeah, it's like our manufactured housing division, but they have their own like titling process. So one's personal property, one's real property. Uh, So one thing we always do is, you know, convert them to real property, which is pretty much like the mobile home. We're making it a house, but there's a lot of like weird stuff Mm -hmm. around like, Oh, do you have to take the axles off? Do you take the wheels off when it's like literally just a formality? Like you tell, like you tell the taxing entities like, Hey, we want this to be a house now. And they're like, cool. Fill out this paperwork. It's a house now. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's some weird stuff with that. Go ahead. Yeah. How how did you figure out all this process? Right. So like people are listening to this like, damn, there's like a lot of things. I mean, I know you didn't go to a mobile home buying school. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, honestly, it's, you just kind of do it as you go. Uh, Dude, we're, we we're super so lucky. We have a practice. We have a badass title company that like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like they're really good at working investors. They're really good at figuring things out. And I had a relationship with them to the extent that like, you know, they didn't do a lot of these, but they'd figure them out. Um, you know, so now they know exactly like how long things take, who to talk to um, at TDHCA, which is like the manufactured housing division in Texas. Um, so they've figured out a lot of stuff. Um, they credit me with like some extra questions on their forms of like, Hey, is this a mobile home? And like some stuff with that. But, uh, honestly, it's just a thing you kind of figure out. And then over time now, like I know what that entails, how long it's going to take a lot of those details or like, Hey, there's no like uh, serial number on this. What do you do if there's no serial number or, you know, different, like just kind of nuances of it. No, you do. There's no serial number. You're like walking around some trailer looking for a serial number like Mike and I have done. And then some dude rolls up yeah. with a gun. 
what are yeah, you doing? That, that happened. <laughs> That's fun. We were going through this like needle infested oh, mobile home. So yeah. And literally the, the, the neighbor rolls up packing heat. And then he was like, what are you guys doing? And we're like, oh, we're looking to buy this place. And he like put his gun back in the holster. He's like, okay, okay good. good. There's a lot of homeless people around here. <laughs> yeah. That's fun. Yeah. That's fun. But the, you're right. That's something Mike and I, we had to learn. Like, we're like, where is the serial number on this thing? Like we'd had yeah. no idea. And so you learn as you go, when you find those requirements. Yeah. And then there's like, at least in Texas, there's like a special like process to like get it a new one if it doesn't have one mm-hmm. which like yeah. there's like jumping through hoops and like that uh like department you call and it's like you can't like you just go through like whoever answers the phone like they won't give you a direct line it's just like well we're working on it and you never know how long anything's <laughs> gonna take <laughs> but uh yeah, right. and then the other big thing is like foundation so um which i've not really retrofitted that many but so if if it's gonna get an fha loan which we've a lot of our buyers are FHA loans on trailers. Um, there has to be a process of it having a permanent foundation, which is kind of, it's kind of nonsense, honestly. Like they literally like you hire this dude for like two, $3,000 and he goes in and like pours some concrete and puts like a, some steel posts and like welds it to the trailer. And then they call it like permanent foundation. And then you get like engineer stamps. Texas, Texas though. And uh, so there's like some of those weird things that like, you just got to figure out along the way of like, you know, how can we finance this? How can we sell it? Like what banks work with people on this stuff. But, uh, you know, like anything, you know, you get, you get paid for figuring out and solving problems. Um, exactly. Yeah. But no, it's a lot of, a a lot of fun. We've done, we've done some pretty good deals on them. Nice. Done some huge ones. Yeah. And I think a, a big takeaway from that too, that we pointed out is because there's these extra hoops, people might be listening to this and being like, man, that's a lot of extra work, but that's why you have so much more opportunities. Mm-hmm. Right. And you know, you've way less competition on the deals. These sellers, as you said yourself, they don't always think it's worth anything. Do you just offer like the land values yep. so and get much steeper deals? Um, it is like, there's just so much opportunity. And like you said, every market has something like yeah. that, right? You just got to identify and the thing. Something like, and it's like, like the one thing I just want to point out on this, Mike, is like people, the reason why people think it's hard is they'll hear something like, oh, financing is hard on mobiles. So like, I don't touch mobiles. It's like, what do you mean it's yeah, hard? They hear yeah. that yeah. idea why. They hard. hear that one time. Yeah, like, or like the, really like, oh, did you take the wheels off? How many times has it been moved? And I'm like, yeah. the standard answer is like, it's never been moved. Like, you want to see if it has a foundation, send your people out, like, everything's there everything it needs is there and until like you prove it's not like yep. i don't care how many times we've exactly. moved it's never removed like yeah. i don't care yeah. um but honestly the, the other big thing is like rehabs are super straightforward on them like if it's built mm-hmm. after 1980 you're not rewiring it you're not replumbing it so there's a lot of like mm-hmm. i look at it i'm like if this is completely in shambles it's going to cost x because the square footage of it i know what materials cost um you know the surprises are like the floors are soft but there's not the like big ticket issues that you don't like, Oh shoot, we had to repawn the entire house or, you know, like here foundations are a big deal. So there's not like the, Oh, the slabs, you know, needs fixed. Oh, when we fixed it, we broke all the plumbing lines. There's 30 grand we didn't expect. So honestly, I think they're pretty straightforward as far as that stuff goes. And, and I like that about them as well. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff, man. I, I love, it. I've always admired from afar, some of the, deals and stuff you've gotten into because that's the other thing too is there's this um preconceived notion that people have about mobile homes like it's only for poor people where they're always shitty but you guys make some of those things like freaking nice well and it's um, it's it's strange like we'll meet people that live in like nice subdivisions and they're like i just want to go out and like live on some land and like have a mobile home and i'm like you have a three hundred fifty thousand dollar house why do you want that but there's this like, I mean, maybe it's everywhere. It's definitely a Texas thing of like owning land is like a big deal. So like a lot of these are on. It's, it's a re- it's a red state thing. So we have the same thing. Because um, a lot of these are on a half acre and we've done several on up to like 10 acres. But it's like, you know, like, cool, I just want land and I can't own it without, you know, this. So I don't know. I don't like my thing is like, I don't have to understand why people want them or want to live there. Like, I don't want to live in them. But as long as someone does, like, we'll figure it out. And, and you only need one exactly. person to be able to sell it. So. Yeah, that's a good point. Cool. You don't you don't have to live in it because somebody else will. Like, so many people overlook that when they're trying to do a rehab on a project or select a property to buy. They're like, "Oh, I would never live here." It's like, no shit. That's why you're the investor. Yep. You're not the you're not the end buyer. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. But awesome. 
Cool. Well, good stuff, Aaron. I appreciate all the insight and everything. Um, we're going to start to wind down the show here and dive into our final three questions. So the first question, I know you have a shit ton of these because I've talked to you about a lot of them, but you got to pick ones. one. What is your craziest real estate investing story? Oh, man. Can, can I do two if I'm quick? Okay. Sure. The quick one is uh, we bought this house like an hour or so away. Um, we get to closing and it had been listed before. I didn't really think anything of it. It was listed for like 110. We bought it for like 60. And then I remember talking to, it was two brothers that owned it. One owned 90%, the other one owned 10. And he had kind of in passing told me his brother's like, you know, like Vietnam vet and like, you know, has some PTSD and stuff going on. Um, and that's why, you know, they decided not to use a realtor. So we get to closing and dude like literally shows up in, in his wheelchair, gun in his bag, pulls a gun out in closing and threatens to shoot everyone in the title office. Uh, <laughs> which I remember, like, I look back and I'm like, oh, he just kind of said that in passing. I didn't think anything of it. And then they, like, call the police and the police is like, well, like, if he tries to shoot people again, just, like, walk away. And, like, literally did nothing. Texas. It's like, well, he's, Texas. like, if he brings out his gun, like, just, you know, don't engage. And I'm like, what in the world? It's, it's like a bear. He just Yeah, arrested. but then somehow, like, he, like, you know, <laughs> Calmed down, put his gun away, left it in the car, and then came back in and signed. Uh, that was a you know random bizarre one. And then like after that, we we hired the same agent, and she like told me these like horror stories of like him calling and like threatening her and stuff, and how her broker was like, "You're not allowed to list this house anymore." And that was like how it actually got canceled. Um, wow, that's. Funny. And then the second one, which is not like super crazy, it's more just like the most bizarre story I've ever had. We had this seller who, uh, every time I talked to her, it was always like, like she had a very distinct, like Irish accent and everything was always just like, you know, she's so busy cause like, you know, her job and like Russia and Ukraine, it was always like, she would never say what she does, but always alluded to like some sort of like, you know, government agency, something or other. Um, so we like, and we eventually buy this house and it's like, it's months and she like keeps canceling because like, she's so busy at work and all this stuff. And then I get there and she's like walking me through the house and her like Irish accent or Scottish or whatever it is. Maybe that's offensive that I don't know which one, but whatever. Anyway, so she's like showing me like, oh, I took this picture. This is where I grew up. Like telling me all these like very detailed stories about like her family in Scotland or Ireland or whatever. And then, um, and even like the way she would say things like, you know, different like dialects of English. Like she would like phrase things that like, isn't how you'd say it in the U S right. Um, and this went on for months. And then I remember talking to our title company and I was like, Oh yeah, like she's from Scotland. She has this cool accent. And they're like, no, she doesn't. And, uh, and so I talked to one of the girls there and she's like, she doesn't have an accent at all. I was like, no, it's subtle. You just don't notice it. You're like, no, she definitely has an accent. And then I talked to Steven, who's like a male in the office who closes everyone. And he's like, no, she definitely had an accent. So, we're all like, you know, arguing whether or not this lady has a freaking Irish accent. And then, uh, and I was just like, no, you guys are wrong. You just don't notice it. And Steven was like on my side with that. And, uh, they're just like, no, she doesn't. Um, so with men, she has an accent with women. She doesn't. And so we buy her house and she refers me to her sister. So I look at her sister's house and her sister's like 100% American. I'm like walking around and I'm like, so how do you not have an accent? She's like, what do you mean? Uh, she's like, what do you mean? I don't have an accent. She's like, I was like, well, your sister, like you guys are from Ireland. Like, how do you like not have an accent at all? And she has like this very like distinguished, you know, accent. She's like, she's not from there. She's like, that's all a lie. <laughs> and then oh she's, like, she's like, telling me this whole story of like, I can't believe she did that to you. She always, oh that's why her husband left her, like all these lies and stuff. Oh she's God. like, she's always meeting these guys on the apps and, every time it's some elaborate story that she can never keep up with. And then we'll, she'll like introduce them to us and we, we can never keep up with their stories. And I'm like, okay, so, and she also tells me how her like son, like naturally speaks Russian and is going to work for the CIA, even though, or FBI or something, even though he's never learned Russian and all like, you know, she had a friend at the agency test his fluency and all this like bullshit. Um, so then I'm like, okay, one more question. Like, what does she do for work? Like, does she work for like the government? She's like, nah, she, she works at Walmart. She's an admin <laughs> at Walmart. So this lady just like makes up this crazy 
weird story of like how she's from like Ireland or Scotland. And it's like everything she's talking to like weaves into it of like all this stuff. And then her sister's just like, nah, she's full of shit. Um, That's hilarious. And it's one of those, you're like, it's not like <laughs> scary or bad or like crazy. It's just real, it's just real bizarre. bizarre. Yeah. But and of course you would run into that person of all people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so she was, she was proposition. I mean, probably. Yeah, and then yeah, her yeah, sister's exactly. like, you can never tell her. I told this. I'm like, when would I ever talk to her again? Like, yeah. 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 Right. But oh God, that's so funny. Yeah, that's a weird one. That is. It was very just very strange. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Nice. Um, all right. Second question: What is the number one tip you would give to a small investor looking to? Uh, sorry, a new investor looking to get started, or a small investor looking to take the business to the next level? Yeah, for a new investor looking to get started, I would, um, you know, figure out someone to do a deal with. Figure out a way to like actually provide someone value. I know you've like ranted on this of like, mm-hmm. you know, people doing things aren't actually providing you value. But uh, I mean, if someone like actually brings me a deal, like I'm willing to like help them and figure it out. Like I don't want to like right. do the like coffee and pick your brain situation. Um, but also like we've, you know, helped someone flip a house that we assign it to them. And it's kind of like, hey, we'll help you with this. But like, no, we're making money on it. So um, mm-hmm. I think people get really greedy with like, I don't want to give up anything or feel like I'm giving up anything. And, um, it's a lot, it's a lot better to learn from someone who's going to, you know, help you figure it out than to like lose a shit ton of money on your first deal, like trying to figure out on your own. Um, and then, I mean, the other thing if if you're trying to take your business to the next level, I think it's getting around people that have done it before, you know, you can figure it out on your own. You can pay to learn or you can get in the spaces and, pay to learn from people who've already done it and just kind of uh, accelerate that process. That's been super, super impactful to me. And I'm sure you guys as well. So valuable. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a huge thing. Alex from says that a lot too, is like, you can learn anything for free these days on like YouTube, but if you go and you find someone you're paying for speed. Mm -hmm. So it comes down to, is it worth it to save the money for for you to take a year to figure it out? Or is it worth it to go pay the money and for you to learn it like next week? Well, especially if we all know success rewards speed. All of the sales and marketing stuff, like it's easy to waste a lot of money not knowing what you're doing. Like, yeah, absolutely cool. Try to run Google ads on your own. Like, you turn on the wrong thing, you just wasted like a thousand bucks, you know? Like, yep. or, or even just direct mail, right? Like, I was messaging with someone um, yesterday who was consistently also in CCF, and I always think it's funny. I get a lot of CCF people that like DM me asking for things. I'm like, isn't that why you're in that right. group still? <laughs> right. Um, but, uh, and, and he was like, yeah, so I've been just sending out just absentee owners um, with 30% equity and just doing that. And I've wasted like $20,000 in marketing. I'm like, well, you're not doing any like niche list stuff. You're not actually targeting people that have distresses. You're just hoping you're going to find a landlord that wants a, wants convenience, right. which in Nashville, Tennessee, which is a very hot market, <laughs> is going to be difficult to find, you know, so... But anyway, um, cool. Uh, that's great advice. All right. And last question, where can people find you, follow you and reach out to you if you'd like them to do so? Yeah, probably the best place just on Instagram. It's uh, just first name dot last name. So at Aaron dot Beal. Um, yeah, glad to. And Beal is B-I-H-L. Yep, glad to help people or, you know, answer questions or if you just want to see me talk shit, there's a lot of that that goes on. Aaron's um, got a great Instagram. He does. I highly recommend yep. Aaron's Instagram. You guys should that's definitely good. give him a follow there. But um, so awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, you do some great stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah, Thanks, and yeah. I always appreciate on your on your Instagram too how you're just no holds barred. You just like blast a lot of the the bullshit. Most a lot of people are too afraid to do that. So yeah, it's very. very yeah, honestly, my thing is like I don't want people to like lose money like on dumb shit. Like it's yeah, it's cool. easy when you're in the game to like see see through it like. Hey, you said you make ten million dollars a month, and you're excited about raising like two hundred grand in private money. Like that doesn't add up. But it's like it's one of those things. If you're yeah. not in it, you don't really you don't see it. You don't see the things. Uh, and you know, I just want people to you know learn from people that are good. For sure, agreed. There's exactly. enough ways to lose yeah. money in real estate. You don't need somebody ripping you off or exactly telling you bullshit that takes you down the wrong path. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, no kidding. But awesome, cool man. Well, thanks so much for hopping on the show. We really appreciate it, and I've really enjoyed. You know, being friends with you over the last couple of years too, man. I'm excited for more years of continuing to grow our businesses together. So hopefully you guys got some good information out of that. You should absolutely reach out to Aaron on Instagram. He is a super helpful guy. More than happy to, you know, 
talk to, talk to you about anything, whether you want to mutually talk trash about other investors or influencers, <laughs> or you want some help looking at mobiles or just some general guidance on being an investor as a whole. Um, he's more than happy to do that. That is one thing that a lot of people have said between other groups that we're in too, is I regularly get stuff of like, oh, I saw you and Aaron answering questions for people in the Slack group. I was hoping to just talk to you directly. Aaron's always the second person on there too. So he's more than happy to chat with you as well. It's just that kind of guy. But uh, yeah, please go give him a follow, shoot him a DM, and you should share this show with anybody who might find it interesting. Um, anyone who's interested in real estate, anyone who is interested in mobile homes, business partnerships, all of that was covered today. And uh, thanks for listening, y'all. We'll talk to you next week. Bye.